Welcome to today's class, where we take a brief tour through the history of orthodontics. It's very interesting how the history of biomechanics is embedded in the history of our specialty. That is, our great challenge has always been to move teeth. And the only way to do this is by applying mechanical forces in order to obtain appropriate biological responses. In this way, understanding how the knowledge was constructed by the precursors of our specialty means understanding our own history. It means understanding the difficulties that had to be overcome and the challenges that we will face during the course of our professional growth. I hope you enjoy this quick revisit to the origins of orthodontics. Before our historical review, let us recall the meaning of the word orthodontics. This beautiful expression originates from the Greek terms orthos, which means straight, and odont, which means tooth. The term then represents straight or aligned teeth. The word also represents the denomination of the first specialty of dentistry, and the concept of the specialty, according to the brilliant professor Robert Myers, is the branch of dentistry related to the study of the growth of the craniofacial complex, the development of occlusion, and the treatment of dental facial anomalies. I really like this concept, because it's not only truth, it also reflects the complexity of our profession. After all, our specialty is fantastic, capable of creating nearly miraculous transformations. In some cases, it's as if we were performing plastic surgery without the use of a scalpel. But orthodontics does not work magic. The transformations in the smiles and face do not happen overnight. There is a lot of knowledge behind the proper orthodontic treatment. We can compare the universe of orthodontics to a puzzle game, or to the game called Tetris, since we are likewise joining the pieces to have a better view of the whole. Several areas of knowledge and related disciplines are needed for understanding this universe. We can see the biogenesis of dentition, craniofacial growth, genetics, embryology, metallurgy, surgery, orthodontic techniques, and phonogeology as key pieces of this puzzle. We cannot forget that the universe of orthodontics is part of a larger one which is governed by universal laws. These laws sustain and govern any area of knowledge. In fact, I would say mainly orthodontics. I'm referring to the laws of biology, which is the study of living organisms, and the laws of mechanics, which is the study of force over bodies. Joining these two areas, we have biomechanics, which represents the study of the mechanics of living organisms. I firmly believe that biomechanics will always be the basis, I mean, the most essential part of orthodontics. Let's take a look into how biomechanics has always been the protagonist of this story. The first personality to describe the irregularities of the dental positions was the Greek physician Hippocrates as in the quote that, among people with an elongated head, some have arched palate, and their teeth are arranged irregularly, crowding with one another. These are troubled by headaches and otorrhea. Years later, a prominent Roman medical author, Aulius Celsus, reported a dental movement in these words. When in a child, a permanent tooth appears before the fall of the correspondent milk tooth, it's necessary to extract it. The remaining tooth must then be pushed with the finger, day by day, until it reaches its proper position. It was the simplest and cheapest way to move teeth, and somehow it worked, but no one had any idea about how it did. <laughs> The truth is that until Renaissance, no one really knew what teeth were. It was in that time that Leonardo da Vinci, one of the greatest genius of history, drew and explained that the teeth were formed by groups, 
each of them with a function, which depend on a dental articulation for the best performance of mastication. But the pioneer in the description of occlusal problems, with indications of solutions, was the author of the first book in dentistry. Pierre for short, presented the first orthodontic appliance, the bandeau, which consisted in a kind of horseshoe, which teeth were tied with silver ligatures. The appliance worked by expanding the teeth, but they didn't know how and why they were moving. Only in the late 18th century, someone discovered that teeth are not bone. A Scottish anatomy professor, John Hunter, was the first scientist to establish the difference between teeth and bone. In his famous book, The History of Human Dentition, he also highlighted the possibility of induced tooth movement by stating that teeth might be moved by applied force because bone moves out of the way of pressure. Up to the late 19th century, the vision of tooth movement was mechanical only. The first biological considerations emerged with Professor Norman Kingsley in the early scientific orthodontic war in America. Kingsley was recognized for developing a series of therapeutic resources for malocclusions including the application of orthopedic forces and the use of mandibular protractors. We have seen a rudimentary description of the biological process of tooth movement in Kingsley's following description. Bone can be absorbed under some influences or reproduce it and when moving teeth, the power used creates a pressure which produces absorption. The quest for a physiological response was intensified by the renowned professor John Farrer, recognized as the father of American orthodontics. Farrer stated that to move teeth, the traction must be intermittent and must not exceed certain limits, so as not to provoke pain or pathological responses. He stressed the importance of respecting a physiological law that governs tissues. The search for the famous ideal force that is still in our field was starting. Finally, we arrive at Dr. Edward Hertel Engel, recognized as the father of modern orthodontics. Do not confuse him with the father of American orthodontics, just mentioned earlier, Professor John Farrer. Farrer and Engel were great scientific rivals, leading the historical conflicts among orthodontic personalities. Such fights are unfortunately still common, often for future reasons such as fame and vanity. <laughs> But back to the subject, we must take off the hat to Mr. Engel, because he was the great genius of mechanics, a writer, a scientist, in short, the great responsible for the creation and reputation of the orthodontic specialty. In addition, he classified and popularized the term malocclusion, as well as developing hundreds of appliances for its treatment. Undoubtedly, his most important and well-known creation was the Edgewise appliance. I strongly believe that this invention constitutes the most relevant in the history of orthodontics to date. Engel managed to obtain the control of tooth movement in the three spatial plans. It's important to remember that the Edgewise appliance has got this name because its action is effective on the edge of the rectangular arch wire. What has changed? Nowadays we do not have to bandage all teeth. The brackets are transparent. We do not have to tie the arch wires. But the system is essentially the same. The prescriptions change, 
there are hundreds of them. But the essence of fixed appliance is the same. If you think of the most modern appliance today, such as the invisible aligners, you notice the different operating mechanics comparing to the fixed appliance. In aligners, you need to use a number of techniques such as computerized planning, elastics, bubbles, or resin blocks to try to achieve the same ultimate goal of fixed appliance, namely, applying controlled force to teeth. In the end, the truth is that any orthodontic appliance will always be governed by the universal laws of mechanics and biology. Therefore, it's worth investing in the knowledge revolving these laws, because in spite of the constant advances in our specialty and of the development of new concepts and appliances, you will understand and be able to use them, because you will be in control of this evolutionary journey of our specialty. The main objective of our course is exactly to address the fundamental concepts of these two major areas of knowledge, because ultimately they are the ones that sustain our clinical practice. Thank <laughs> you.